and I see all my colleagues have joined me. Um, Pre-March 2020, the big challenge we all had was how do you actually deal with a completely virtual engagement? Fast track two years, and now we're struggling to deal with a hybrid engagement, so please bear with us. But um, we're fortunate today to have a complete change in topic and trend and way of thinking to where we've been for the rest of the morning. Um, Nicole Monsami, as I've been introduced earlier, I am from the Industrial Development Corporation. I'm the Business Development Manager in the Textiles and Wood Business Unit. Two very distinct value chains, but similar challenges and quite an exciting space to be in. And I have the honor this morning of sharing the platform, virtual and physical, with some might call them titans of industry, and whatever compliments I do bestow upon them, I'm sure it's going to be held against me going forward. <laughs> um, but yes, honestly, a privilege to be part of the SAFI engagement and also to share a bit about what is happening in our clothing and textile space. Our title for our panel discussion is Cohesion, Together is Better, Lessons from the RCTFL Master Plan. And I think the obvious question that everybody would ask, and I've actually got this, I've been trying to meet people in the sector, thanks Greg. And the first question, or the glaze that goes over people's eyes the minute I say I'm from clothing and textiles is, what could you possibly know about the furniture sector? They're so different, why are you even in the room discussing this with us? But I think the one thing I want to bring to your attention is, from about the late 90s, early 2000s, the clothing and textile space was a massive employer. We were contributing significantly to GDP, we had massive production output, and as time has gone on, we've seen jobs, losses of at least 50% of our workforce, productive capacity reduced significantly, a massive influx of imports, as well as loss of critical skills. And I think those four sectors all resonate with where we see, or some of the signs we see in the furniture sector. But what was a catalytic event for the sector was the signing of a social pact in 2019, the Retail Clothing, Textiles, Footwear and Leather Master Plan. And what I'd like to share, what the panel would like to share with you today is, what are some of the lessons and learnings we can take out of this retail-led master plan that could be beneficial to where we find ourselves as a furniture sector? So with that, I'm just going to do a quick round of introductions. Um, I'm hoping to keep this very conversational. I know we've, uh, to John's point earlier, this is the proper graveyard shift now, just before lunch. So I'll try and keep it conversational and keep everybody's interest peaked as much as possible. But for purposes of introduction, I'm going to start with my colleagues joining us online. Um, the first person I see closest to me on the screen is Michael Lawrence, who is an executive director at the National Clothing, oh, Clothing Retailers Federation. Sorry, Michael. <laughs> um, in both his professional and personal capacities, he occupies many boards, sits on many committees. But I must say that he only joined textiles when he got tired of teaching high school children how to do formulas in sums. So glad that you had a change of profession and joined us, Michael. Uh, the next person on screen is Etienne Flock. Um, he's the National Policy Director at the South African Clothing and Textiles Workers Union. And I think it would be a bit superfluous of me to run through his accreditations and uh, accomplishments. And I just, if I could summarize Etienne, it would be that he's a people's person. And at the heart of everything he does and the, what drives his enthusiasm and passion is that he's here for people, his constituents and the sector at large. Um, physically with us in the room, we, I must say, um, the very first weaving shed I ever visited was in September 2009 in the middle of a sugarcane plantation. I was officially scared for my life, but there I met Imran Bucks and was introduced to Imran Textiles Mills, which if anybody has ever been to Ifafa Beach, you would never consider a textile mill to be there, but alas, we have a thriving textile mill. And um, 
I suppose whatever I say next needs to be cautious because I still have my video review coming up, is Mark Goliath who gets up our textiles and clothing business unit. So with those brief introductions, I'm going to go straight into a bit of um, conversation. And I'm going to start with you, Michael, if that's OK. We have a retail clothing and textiles, footwear, leather master plan. If I could ask you just to touch base on very quickly, what does the NCRF do firstly? But secondly, what was the hesitancy or were there any hesitancies or challenges that retailers potentially saw in having retail as part of the title of a master plan? Hi, Nicole, and, I, and hi to everyone. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so the Federation represents most of the major um, retailers in, in, in South Africa. And um, in, in kind of the, the teen years of the 2000s, um, we, we, we find ourselves in a very peculiar situation of, of being quite adversarial with, with, with many of the value chain participants um, the product manufacturers, the textile manufacturers, government, uh, um, Etienne, Etienne's um, outfit there, the, the, the Saktu guys. Um, and, and really, we, we, we were fighting over scraps and, and over silly issues when, when what, what, what was becoming increasingly clear was, was there were much bigger issues um, at stake. Um, we, we, we look at trade and economic issues in the Federation um, so, so, so let me be very clear. We we identified a perfect storm of opportunity in that the east was becoming less attractive. Look, it's always it's it's got it's got scale and and it's got operations that are that, that, that are not going to cease as as an attractive source in 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 a hurry. But um, it was looking increasingly less attractive. We identified a number of of of, of very real challenges that we thought we could be part of contributing to solutions um, locally, um, nationally, and, and, and regionally. Um, and, and so really, um, there was actually no hesitation. What, what became the tipping point for us was, was recognizing um, that what we actually had were, 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 was quite a lot of cohesion of, of ideas, but typically in the, in the retail clothing and textile space. It was, uh, it was a lot more difficult operating outside, outside of the retail space. Um, I, I always am very proud of the fact that um, that the NCR have actually co-funded the initial master plan, um, and and we we've chosen to remain passionately active in 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 the way in which the master plan is in, is being implemented. Um, we can speak about its 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 um, successes and 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 its challenges in in, in a little while, but certainly from a retail side, um, both within the federation and I think in fairness to non-members of the Federation, quite a number of other large retailers um, have, have actually seen this as um, not just an inevitability, but, uh, but, a, but a preferred choice of operation. Thanks, Michael. Um, just leaving you off one of the points you raised, um, you referred to Etienne right next door to you. And if I could hand over to you, Etienne, I mean, retail was not as um, Lauren said, there were some challenges in the market prior to this cohesion that we now speak of under the master plan. Coming from a SAC to organized labor point of view, what were some of the initial hesitancies or challenges that US labor had to come to terms with in adopting a plan led by retail? Well, um, Nicole, uh, good afternoon and good afternoon to, to um, everyone on that side. I mean, the first very obvious difference is that I wear red T-shirts and Michael wears bow ties. And, and so this was a, a real difficult thing to overcome. As you can see, we, we've accepted those changes and, and we're moving on. You know, um, they, they, in, the, in the 2000s especially, there was a great deal of suspicion from, from SACTU and from, from its members to, towards retailers for a few reasons. The one is that, that we attributed a lot of the problems uh, in the industry at that stage to the retailers, especially to the retailers uh, buying more product um, uh, offshore. And, and also, we we're very suspicious of the retailers because of the tremendous amount of power that they hold in, in our value chain, you know, contrary to maybe some, 
value chains like food or agro-processing, et cetera, where, where some of the brand holders and manufacturers uh, hold, hold a lot of power. In our sector, as I suppose in, in parts of, of furniture as well, the retailers hold a tremendous amount of power. And I, and I think that, that that suspicion, you know, is exemplified when, you know, a little anecdote in the early 2000s, Saktu was protesting outside a, a Mr. Price shop in Cape Town. And we were protesting because we were trying to get them to buy local. And suddenly a car drove past and almost knocked down one of our shop stewards. And, and we were very worried and went to her and checked what was going on. And, and as we established that she was fine, she said to us that she actually thinks that she knew who was driving that car. And so we were very interested and asked, well, well, who is it, comrade? Who, who tried to knock you over? She said, I saw him. I think it was Mr. Price himself driving that car trying to knock me over. And, and I think that exemplifies the, the, the suspicion. You know, in the 2000s, we set up a, a sector strategy called the Customized Sector Program, and the retailers were not involved. And so very soon it became clear to us, and we didn't achieve the successes we wanted. So it was clear to us that this time around it was important because of the power of the retailers, because of their strategic position to involve the retailers. And, and to make sure that they are part of it. And, and for me, listening to, to, to um, yourselves today at this um, a, a forum and also knowing what I know about the furniture sector, I, I think the importance of, of having retailers is, is absolutely crucial. Thanks, Etienne. Um, the one element of the value chain that Imran will speak to is how do you as a manufacturer, Imran, how do you bring to mind or bring it to your manufacturing strategy when implementing this master plan, the objectives and requirements of both labor and retail as a manufacturer? Thanks, Nicole. Uh, thanks, Nicole. Hi, everybody. Um, I think that's actually a very good question. In terms of uh, retail, I think that uh, they were very clear about what they wanted or what they expected from manufacturers and, and, and textile manufacturers in particular. The products that they sold was essentially consumer driven, right? When we had quite a few debates building up to this master plan in terms of its uh, the, the, you know development uh, prior. And what we wanted essentially was retail to buy what we produced. And that wasn't necessarily going to happen. What happened actually was retail told us quite clearly, these are the products that they needed. And if they needed the onshore products, they had them already. They were already coming in from the east. So for us to have an opportunity to supply to them, we had to produce what they needed. So I think we had to understand that. And, 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 and I think there was this premise at the beginning, essentially, to retain the capacities that we had within the country and the opportunity to grow it further. So retention was the first point. For us, it was a little easier as a company, um, not talking about all of the weavers or knitters or, or spinners, but for us, it was a little easier because we already supplied into that space, into the retail space. So we used that as a starting point. And the opportunity obviously came about, and we look, look back on this a year later, and we find that we've introduced new products, and those new products are being accepted into the retail space. And we, we, we are very happy uh, to see that the opportunity is there for volume growth and we're in the middle of projects. This incentive that you uh, was introduced to you a few weeks ago is something that we're also looking at and that's what we're using to essentially uh, expand uh, our, our volume and our opportunity to the future. So yes, there was an initial understanding that we had to accept that. Once we accepted that, you know, things started to move on, and and that's where, that's where the opportunities came from and are coming from going forward. In terms of labor, uh, I'm not saying this because Etienne is there behind me. Is I think as a company we have a good relationship with labor and our staff. I think it was an easier uh, kind of process. Uh, we were very involved in the master plan process of having uh, uh, labor as as part and parcel of the whole process, and I think that was very very important. We generally, as a company, myself, you know, I don't believe in an adversarial type of relationships. I look more towards uh, solutions. 
and I think uh, for us uh, that's that's worked pretty well. Uh, my background, you know, I mean, I'm a textile designer. I worked in uh, factories. I, I basically come from the shop floor myself. A lot of people that work with us actually are people that I work side by side with in factories. So, you know, we have a different relationship with our staff. So it may be different for other companies, but that's been uh, our story. Thanks. I think I'll just speak a bit louder because the mic's going to go right sure. next door to Mark. Um, Mark, we've seen the commitment and the initial um, thoughts from both from both from retail, labor, and manufacturers in terms of where they initially were, and also coming out in the conversation has been the already the positives of participating in this master plan as a government as an enabler. Um, the IDC stands as, as an enabler. What role did the IDC play in the master plan? And actually, were you ready to implement the master plan or enable the implementation of the master plan? This will definitely impact your media review. <laughs> um, uh, I'm glad that you mentioned the word enabler because the, the IDC at its core is an enabler for government policy. And we do that through funding opportunity. Um, and when the RCTFL master plan came to fruition, um, IDC was involved through the initial talks um, because the realization was that funding would be needed to localize. Uh, we would need to expand existing factories. We would need to bring on a new uh, capacity in areas. and. Uh, if I was completely honest about it, uh, we were not ready as IDC to understand the scope and depth. What do I mean by that? We thought we understood the, the uh, CTFL value chain very well. Um, but when the rubber hit the road, we realized that we didn't. And it's only in the last eight months that we've re-strategized around how we can best support that industry. When I, when I take that a step further and I look at the furniture industry, because uh, when Nicole introduced me, she said that uh, I look after clothing and textiles, which is true. Um, but the wood value chain is equally as important, um, both from an employment opportunity perspective and a developmental and transformation perspective, which are the key pillars for, for um, funding for the IDC. And the one question which we asked right at the beginning when we started having discussions around the furniture master plan taking on board some of the lessons learned through our, uh, our rctfl master plan is what does your value chain look like where are the areas that your value chain will need support where are the areas that you need expansion where are the areas that you need new capacity to support the localization strategy very few people could tell us or give us indications. Nobody could definitively tell us. And that poses a quick, uh, a problem. Um, how do you develop a sector strategy without understanding the full value chain? And when I say develop, I'm speaking about IDC. We, we're trying to develop a sector strategy for furniture as well. But we are not clear where we need to play an active role. So our response at the moment is very reactionary instead of pro proactive, where we can look at those gaps and opportunities. And I think to me, that is a, a big learning that has come out and then hence it's a key criteria and outcome for the master plan that we do that bit of work as quickly as possible. Uh, so that it not only supports us, but supports everybody, including labor, uh, retail and manufacturers. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so my panel has snookered me a bit, um, but I think it speaks to the success of the master plan. When we did the initial brief, I was like trying to get to what didn't they want to participate in and then build up to what is the success factors. But as you can tell from the discussion, everybody's speaking with the positive about the implementation of the master plan. And I think that speaks to the importance of an entire value chain being invested in the outcomes. And I want to touch on a couple of points that were raised in terms of what have been the key successes. And 
Now, to start with you, Imran, you said that initially you were manufacturing what you were manufacturing, not what retail wanted. How have you been able, or are we seeing a shift in manufacturing behavior to be more aligned to that? And what are kind of some of the su success factors we could apply to the furniture space? Okay. Um, like I mentioned, we were already producing certain products, right? And what happened was, um, through the clothing manufacturers and so forth, we were given an opportunity to develop new products. So it was clear to us that the research and development side and, and, and issues such as that was became critical. So we invested in machinery that could essentially meet those kind of targets. We had to reduce our lead times in terms of uh, uh, new products, strike-offs, uh, uh, research work, new designs, all that sort of thing. And uh, I think it worked very well because uh, the retail uh, market responded. And through that process, what we found was an increase or a demand uh, for new products. And uh, uh, so the investment in all of that equipment, machinery, and so forth, it's really paid off after a year or so. And we continue to do that uh, uh, at the moment. In fact, the, the volume uh, that we plan to increase in the next six months or so is going to be almost 25% of, of, of where we uh, currently are. So it's quite a substantial uh, improvement or increase uh, for us. We're talking about you know almost a million meters more. And what that million meters does is, you know, the TTI has a ratio that every million meters of fabric uh, produced, uh, if it goes into the local value chain, has an effect of around 5,000 jobs. So we already contribute to around 15,000. So this will take it on to 20,000. So that's a kind of impact that this actually has uh, on, the value, on the local value uh, chain. Thanks, Imran. I think that was a perfect step. I was actually going to ask Etienne a question. I mean, Imran speaks about the investment into machinery as driving their productivity and productive output. What is your view or Labour's view in terms of investment in technology versus the cliché view that you would only want a labour-intensive um, production system? So, so, of course, the, the the immediate reaction would be that we would be very concerned that that a, a over reliance on an investment in technology would mean that that jobs may be lost. But you know, if if we um, consider and focus on the on the objectives of the master plan, which is in, to increase the number of jobs and to and to replace imports and so on. And for us, it does not automatically mean that that you know more machines, better machines, would mean a replacement of jobs. You know, take something as simple as as you know the future of work, or, or what's often described as the fourth industrial revolution. You know, taking buying new machines um, to 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 ensure increased automation for us does not automatically mean that that we should lose uh, members or that the industry should lose workers it could well mean that we start to replace imports with those machines and in actual fact create more jobs than we currently have then just means that we that we you know fight over the small pie that we have currently locally and those orders that we do make locally and try and uh, uh, replace those with machines. You know, let's rather be strategic about it and think about how do machines help us to to replace imports. And and for us, Nicole, that you know that that's a crucial part in this master plan is there there needs to be a recognition of the role that everyone can play, and there needs to be a recognition of what ultimately is their objectives here. So, so as soon as I realized that what it is that that the textile manufacturers would want out of the master plan and what Imran needs to deliver to their members, and similarly with Michael, you know, then we start working together to ensure that we achieve that. There's a narrow focus on, you know, just uh, putting more machines in to drive the profit, not just don't we uh, achieve the objectives of the master plan, but I'm also uh, not helping my partners to achieve um, their objectives and satisfy their, their members. Thanks, Etienne. So onto your member on your screen with you, uh, Michael. Has retail seen the benefits of the master plan implementation? So, so this is an easy answer uh, as well. Um, we, we have seen a huge amount of 
um, unleashing of the retail balance sheets back into in, into manufacturing. Um, we, we're seeing a, a massive, um, either massive buy-up or substantive investment um, taking place in within manufacturing, local manufacturing um, from retail. And, and I think, Nicole, um, the, we, we're working off a very solid research base in terms of in terms of numbers, as Etna has just said. Um, look, I mean, we SARS tells us that less than forty percent of, of product is 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 locally made within the within the the master plan community itself. Um, that that number is closer to forty five percent at the moment already. Um, so there's obviously a non master plan community that that still has to kind of get its get its act together and may even be doing a couple of um, uh, some illegal things and some some shady things and that in itself creates an opportunity for us who, who are going to do things properly because we have to we have to trust the enforcement modality as well. But over and above all of that, um, as 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 an opportunity for market. Um, we, John has just been speaking about AFTA and the opportunities, not just regionally, but continentally. Um, the fact of distribution services, which retail is very interested in, in positioning itself as, a, as an offensive business interest, um, um, certainly regionally in SADC, but um, I, I can't imagine that there they will, will not ultimately be, be um, a lot of interest shown further on in Africa as, as African markets develop and as the um, and as consumer demand becomes um, uh, more aligned with what with what does happen in South Africa. So we're seeing an immense amount of opportunity and we and and, for, and certainly for us the, 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 the investment, the direct investment, um, that has taken place over and above the, the 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 commitment to to walking journeys that are far more developmental than than the pure transactionality that used to take place a decade ago um, is is I think evidence of, of of the benefits that that we are seeing and the opportunities we we are seeing substantive commercial opportunities if uh, if we all pull our way together and roll this out in 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 the kind of pragmatic manner which which is both the spirit and 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 the text of of, of our master plan agreement. Thanks, Michael. I think the overwhelming comment I took out of your last point was that the master plan has seen commercial benefit for you. I step back to where Etienne had said that the master plan is developing and creating jobs. And to Imran's point, we are seeing an increase in production. So if I could, every stakeholder along this value chain has benefited. What would be if I could, in closing, because I'd like to leave some time for questioning, if I could ask each of our panelists to summarize the most critical success factor in your space, what has been the most critical success factor of the RCTFL master plan that has led to the success in your element of the value chain? Can I start with you, Imran, because, or unless Etienne, you're ready. <laughs> uh, I'm ready. You, you saw me move to the mouse. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm ready. Now, I, I think for me, it's the recognition of the power of social dialogue, um, Nicole. I, I think it's understanding that that social dialogue can, you know, identify problems, solve problems. It's a recognition that that government doesn't have all the answers to, for instance, deal with customs fraud. It's a recognition that Michael does not know all the places where he, his members can buy locally. And if we can work together on that, you know, then, then help, that helps us. And, you know, we've been able to solve some very important problems because of our willingness and ability to talk to each other. It's difficult sometimes. It's arduous. But but you know that 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 is a critical success factor for us. Thanks, Etienne. Imran. Thanks, Nicole. Um, if I were to answer that, I think for me it's uh, synergy. It was a synergy that was created with the RG uh, the CFL master plan, and uh, and what it actually it created conversation. Uh, uh, what we actually did was, you know, uh, increase each other's strengths and cancel out each other's weaknesses. So there's no downside to it. So that's what I think I'll take out of this is, is the synergy and the working together. Thanks. Michael? Yeah, I, I think for me, the, the big win has been uh, moving past the mist of, of ideology. I, I, I think there are always going to be substantive um, 
differences in 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 some in in some of the elements of the way we 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 approach um, um, the value chain from whether it's from manufacturing, organized labor, or, or retail side. Um, but you 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 must get past past the fog, and and embrace each other's values in a way that is that that is actually helpful at the end of the day. Um, and I and I think we 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 as as Etienne has said, and I mean Imran has been there as well. We, we, what we don't, we, we're reflecting successes um, quite happily, here, Nicole. But, but it's been a hard, it's been a hard journey. I mean, uh, you know, it's 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 been not just robust. There's been a little bit of a little bit of sweat, a little a, a little bit of tears, and probably a lot of blood um, left behind as well. Because, um, and that's been necessary. And, and I think, you know, let's let, let, let's not be kind of romantic about about the process. But it, it has been worth it because we've, 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 we've forced ourselves to look seriously at ourselves. Thank you. And then, Mark. Yeah, I've, I've seen that sweat and blood. Uh, having sat through many of those, those meetings um, myself. But I, I sit in those meetings as an independent person, not playing an active role in the value chain. And that's helpful. Uh, from time to time, we've acted as mediator um, in some of these discussions. And I think it's important um, to note that, you know, it's, as, as the furniture industry moves into this progression now, uh, going forward, the level of transparency uh, between, or well, in the value chain, um, is, I think, has created this environment. Um, and I say transparency, I mean, each retailer still has its own uniqueness, but there can be transparent discussions around where the products can be offered to that specific retailer or not at the price points they're requiring or not, um, so that we don't waste time chasing the tail. Um, I was having a conversation with somebody earlier that it's equally as important to identify what we cannot do as a local manufacturing unit, as it is important to know where we can play an active role. And I think what the RCTFR master plan has done well is identify those, put a roadmap to the ones we can play actively, and really engage and, and double down on it. And the ones we can't, those will be imported until such time that it can be competitively manufactured. And there is that recognition. And I think it must be the starting point and then something that has stuck with me through this entire process. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before I summarize and close up, um, any questions for our panelists? Um, yeah, uh, specifically, it's going to go ahead. Yes, yes. <laughs> As, as a manufacturer, um, um, Imran, why Fafa? <laughs> um, specifically, you, you know, because all of all of my employees come from the Eastern Cape, come from KZN. Um, I think there's one or two from um, locally, from Soweto, um, and and uh, also I'm, I'm a former bank manager. Usually. Um, companies move to labor, not the other way around. We know why it has happened in South Africa, though. Um, so why FAFA? I'd like to know. And what has your experience been, being so far out, particularly with regards to logistics? Sure. Thanks. Sure. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> Uh, I'll, 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 I'll tell you the truth, right? <laughs> 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 I've said this to too many different people over the years. First and foremost, uh, uh, you know, that's pretty much where I grew up as a shoe cane farm. You know? And uh, it was my family's uh, farm, actually, so the land was uh, cheap. <laughs> <laughs> and in those days, uh, when we started the factory there around 1997, uh, we actually moved from an industrial area out to the farm and we actually found that better. But uh, at that stage, there was uh, de-industrialized wage rates as well, right? But in that immediate vicinity of around 30 kilometers, we had uh, 
skilled workers that came from other factories as well. Most factories closed down over a period of time. And we were able to attract some of those people to work for us. And uh, working in that environment over a period of time was actually, we found, very conducive. Once you got down there, it's a peaceful environment, it's a good place to work. Um, the factory is based on, uh, on, on basically on a, on a bank of a river. So if you look at weaving, you know, the natural humidity was around 60%. So it actually worked out very, very well. And that's without expensive air conditioning and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, so ultimately it worked out well over a period. In terms of logistics, we are 90 kilometers from our main customer base, which is Durban. But if you look at the kind of costs that the metro has compared to what we have on there, it actually mitigates it to a large extent. So yes, you know, if I look back on it, would I put the factory there now? Maybe not. But if we look at where we are now, we're actually expanding there. We have the opportunity to expand uh, in other places. Mark and Nikon knows the projects that we propose, but we chose to stay in Ifafa because we found that uh, there are other benefits that mitigate some of the downside to being in a um, you know commercialized industrial area. Yeah, thanks. Uh, to the panelists, uh, in the um, in the textile industry master plan, in, in what you guys have been doing, how have you dealt with the illicit imports and enforcement and that? How have you guys approached that whole thing? Okay. With great difficulty. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm not going to wait, Nicole. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's substantively the biggest challenge we think collectively um, as, as, uh, the, 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 that faces us um, is, you, I mean, ultimately what you want is an architecture that is, that is accountable, uh, usable, transparent and fair. Um, and, and what we don't have with the, with the extent, Etienne was doing a presentation to the NPA yesterday and reminded them that we, um, we, the, 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 the studies, and obviously it's very difficult to measure the extent of illegal trade, but the studies show that we probably in the region of, 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 of something in the order of 100 billion rand at least of illegal trade in, in, in this value chain. Um, of, well, of revenue lost um, certainly in this value chain, and so um, yeah, it's it is a substantive problem. We we work very hard with 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 sales. We, in fact, most of the blood that I spoke about leaving around <laughs> is probably true. Is us trying to leave sales blood on the floor quite a bit. Um, because it 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 fundamentally um, is their problem and. And, and it's not just a, again, this is not just a, a local problem. Um, as we go out into, um, as we go out into working in other countries and, 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 and leveraging off everything that we can benefit from in developing local manufacturing capacity, we, we're going to need the revenue and customs authorities wherever we go to trade that are, that are able to accountably and responsibly operate um, with within whatever trade architecture agreement exists, whether it is whether it is a regional economic community or a, a, a AFTA or or just the just the rules of of, of WTO, we it, it's it's a substantive problem. Um, we what we comfortable about at the moment, I think, and maybe Etienne would speak to it further. I suppose Nicole. Um, what we comfortable about is that it, it we're we're addressing it. Sorry. Nicole, that was load shedding. Uh, my apologies. Um, uh, what we come to about at the moment, I was saying, is is that um, we, we've got the problem front and center um, right now, um, but certainly we have we have a way to go to addressing it, and and um, and we'll continue addressing it simply because um, the big win there is going to translate into huge opportunities everywhere else. Nicole, if, if I can just add, um, 
uh, two things. The, the one is that, um, you know, Penwell earlier in his presentation spoke about fair competition. And I think um, the master plan has meant that we're all focusing on this together. So, so Michael is interested in customs fraud and illicit imports for different reasons than, than what we as a trade union are and for slightly different reasons than what, what Imran and, and the manufacturers are. But now we're all thinking about the problem together and trying to, to solve it. And I wanted to, to just share one example. Um, a couple of years ago, SAR stopped a, a, an import agent called Dragon Freight. And, uh, and it brought in about a dozen containers or so full of very, very undervalued uh, clothing goods. Then uh, confiscated these, these goods and, and the, the import agent and its clients responded by taking SARS to court. Now, in the past, SARS would have fought this fight and probably and they lost the first battle and probably then have capitulated and said, no, that's fine. You know, unfortunately, we've lost this. We've, we gave it a go. It may not even have gone to court. It was just accepted a fine. But it went to court and then subsequently the manufacturers joined SARS, the trade union joined SARS and, and the retailers lent a lot of info or provided a lot of information and affidavits and so on. So through the, the, the master plan forums and so on, we could all focus our energy on this, contribute to this, make the case in front of the judge and subsequently the case went to the Supreme Court of Appeal. Where, 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 where it was confirmed that SARS has the power to confiscate these goods and it's, and it's armed SARS to work much better with under invoiced imports. So for me, that's a, 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 an excellent example of, of working together, dealing with, with illicit trades. Um, Justin, I can only echo that sentiment with all the colleagues here. And normally we just send Etienne and his members to the SARS offices um, <laughs> in their head and <laughs> I think on a practical level, uh, the starting point is that I think on the CTFL side, um, the tariff code headings are very specific. And it makes a big difference. Um, because at least you know, you have, a, you have an idea of, of what's coming in illegally. Right. Um, and I know that in the furniture industry, there has been some improvement over the last year, but generally the tariff codes are very broad and you can drive a bus through them. So I think if you, if you think about it practically, there are some lessons to learn uh, from the clothing and textile side. And, and I'm sure the guys here would be happy to speak. You know, they can quote tariff codes to you uh, <laughs> for certain items, which I can't. Um, but I think practically speaking, there needs to be a starting point. And I think that's a very good starting point because there is a focus on it from a SARS perspective, but they're going to need help. Got time for two more questions. Um, Hi everyone. Um, Nicole, you mentioned that the success of the clothing industry master plan was uh, it was retail driven, all right? And if we look at the clothing retail uh, landscape, it's dominated by major players as opposed to independent uh, traders. And from my experience, I've, uh, you know, I grew up in a, from a clothing retailer's home and I saw that business capitulate because of uh, larger retailers. Um, and if you go in, into any metropole or any CBD, you'll find very few independent clothing retailers. You find a lot of uh, formalized, we call it formalized uh, clothing retailers. However, in the furniture industry, I think it's a bit of the opposite, right? Um, in the past, you, you would find a lot of formal uh, furniture retailers, but if you take a drive to, through any you know, major CBD, you know, out of 30 furniture stores, you'll find your big guns there, um, and they five or six, and the rest of them are independent furniture traders. And talking to the point of illegal and illicit uh, trade, so there's a couple of uh, issues there. We, you can talk about product and how they operate the business. And they're two separate uh, methods of, of how, how our business is run. If you just look at a product, uh, from a product point of view, um, a lot of that product is the illicit trade that's brought in. So under invoiced uh, case goods, um, 
you'll find a lot of it. You'll find very little in bedding and lounge, right? Um, be, just because of the nature of bedding and lounge in the low-end furniture market, um, you find high, you know high-end retailers are importing legally, but the low-end you can't import a bit. You can't import a lounge at a price that, that you can uh, manufacture it locally. So it's really down to the case goods, the glassware, um, the steel type of products. Now the challenge we face is, I mean, we, uh, as a furniture, I, I, I've got the privilege of being a retailer and a manufacturer, um, both of scale, I would say. And what I find is, if I had to go to China and uh, just do a costing for one of my suppliers on a case goods product, um, all things being equal, I can manufacture a product maybe at a 5% additional cost. And it makes sense when you look at the whole, you know, complications of imports uh, versus uh, getting it done locally, you, you, you tend to go to the local locally produced product. However, <laughs> the same product is being sold um, from, a, from an importer out of, I mean, let's face it, a China mall, if you want to call it, um, to the normal public at a price that you can import it. And I can, I mean, you can, you can import 50 containers of one product. And here a guy who's selling it out of his shop in a China mall is wholesaling it <coughs> for, uh, you know, just the dollar price that you would pay, pay in China, forget the freight cost. Now, there's, there's a key differences between the furniture and clothing industry. Um, and I don't know how to sort this problem out. Uh, we, we're trying to work with SARS and, and see, see, see how to get it uh, sorted out. But, I mean, I don't know if my colleagues in, in clothing, I've got it totally wrong, if my analysis is totally wrong. Um, is there any, like, uh, learnings that they can share with us um, to, to, so that we can move forward on that point? So I think there's, there's two questions, Mahmoud. I'm going to try and split your question comment into two and get inputs on two. The first is, how do we get cooperation between numerous retailers? You said that the furniture landscape is um, categorized by smaller independents. I'm going to throw that one to Michael. In terms of what are some of the learnings or options available to the furniture side in terms of getting a coherent retail mindset for the furniture space? And then the second question, I think, was partially answered by the import issues that we spoke to. But I want to then throw that between Etienne and Imran in terms of what is the manufacturing response to that kind of scenario where the cost of imported goods is being sold at a ridiculous price point? So if I can go to you first, uh, Michael, in terms of learnings on how to bring coherent operation in the retail space. No, I, I, if, if I knew the full answer to that, I'd, um, I'd be retired on a, on a little island by now. <laughs> um, I, I, I want to say that the, the, the incorrect assumption is that we have, we have um, some degree of, of, of completeness in, in our collation. We have a huge number of mom and pop shops, a huge number of the so-called China malls to deal with. Um, the, in, the, 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 the smaller and informal clothing retail space in this country is, um, is, 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 is actually surprisingly large when put together as, as a whole um, and is a substantive part of, of where the illegally traded goods um, go. And we have exactly the same problem as just being described now. And again, we've had, we have instances, so as we'll tell you, a full woolen suit is declared at a at a price of one dollar and a little bit at, at port. I mean, you can't you can't, the I mean, buttons cost more than the than the than the whole suit. Um, of course, when they sell that, when they try and sell that to my members, they they're not selling it at a dollar fifty. They sell you know they're selling it for substantially more, um, but but just enough less so that we we don't pay attention to what is locally available from a from a commercial point of view. Um, we are we are increasingly working um, together as 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 a retail to to address the problem. We have um, some of the larger retailers who are my members have even indicated to SARS a, a willingness to have much higher levels of, of data sharing. Um, but also what we want to see is more sophisticated di digital platforms um, that run um, data analytics. Um, so for example, if a container is 
if a container is is insured for a hundred dollars, I'm just putting a number out there, but is declared at ten dollars, its value is declared at ten dollars. What the hang is going on? I mean, why 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 would that be necessary? Um, there are, there are different ways we believe of of running of running data checks, cross checks, to 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 determine to what extent your your risk profiling needs to needs to be addressed um, uh, more intelligently. But, and now you, I do want you to go to my other colleagues in the room, the best answer is still to work together with manufacturing and labor. Thank you. It's manufacturing and labor. Yeah, it can, it can go first. Thanks, Imran. Um, so, so I think a, 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 a Mark spoke about the kind of first practical step, which may be to go to SARS and develop some new um, um, tariff lines. And, and there are SARS specialists who can sit down with the industry. I'm not sure of the extent of it and, and so on, but can sit down with the industry and, and um, introduce or, or, or put together the architecture um, for new HS eight digit tariff lines, which would mean that you'd have more specific product lines. The next step, Nicole, would be to, to consider reference prices. So, so for instance, in clothing, textiles and footwear, we've introduced reference prices some years ago already. And, and it is not a, a price under which you cannot import because that would be legal in terms of the WTO rules, but it's at least a, 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 a um, trigger for, for SARS. So when somebody declares a product at below that price, the little red flag goes up at SARS. SARS then can uh, decide whether to scratch around more to start looking at the kind of things that Michael has said. What is it insured for? How much was it declared? Where's the documentation, etc. Now, um, uh, that reference price, you know, is based on things like what's the raw material prices, what, what's the kind of average uh, 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 um, trading prices for those specific goods. It's not fail safe. Over time, we're finding it to, to lose some of its effectiveness. But as a start, it's extremely useful to help deal with, with, uh, with uh, uh, the problems that the colleague has described of these undervalued uh, case goods. Um, just to uh, try and shed some light on <coughs> my comments, um, the clothing industry and textiles has exactly the same problem that you have. We've had it for 28 years. And there's a large number of uh, informal traders also in our sector, as uh, Michael has mentioned. And that's essentially where we now have the problem from what we've seen as the Textile Federation, from the stats that we get from SARS on a monthly basis. And what's happened now, after one year, what we've seen is the creativity comes in. The people that are signatories to the master plan essentially are playing fair. So all of that's working reasonably well. And everybody that isn't, and those are the informal traders and everybody else, you see that massive uh, uh, sort of numbers that are occurring in that space. And for us, for 28 years, it's been in the billions of underdeclared and uh, duty dodged goods. So that's where it's occurring now. But what I've found uh, over that period has been a lot of frustration. But for us, uh, since the implementation of the master plan, I think we created an interagency working group. And I think uh, that's uh, actually gaining some traction, which is great. Yeah. I just wanted to, to add something. And I think Etienne, uh, you know, he's, he's too gracious. Uh, to the role that labor plays in this organized labor. Um, this problem has been around as England said for a long time. And to some extent you need a champion. Whistleblowers. You know, whistleblowers live through anonymity because I mean in the clothing and textile space, and it might be the same in furniture, uh, there are mafias that run the, the illicit trade. Labor has been very vocal and been the champion. Um, and happy to whistleblow on behalf of industry. When there are companies such as Etienne Ray's, uh, I can't remember the name now, but I read Dragon Thread, uh, and they championed that and laid the cases um, against. So I'm not necessarily directing this at our labor colleagues. I think they might have left. Um, but 
I think what we underestimate is the role that organized labor can play to support an industry like this. Um, SAC2 has been a great supporter of the clothing and textile footwear leather industry for, for even a day. And they've contributed positively. In terms of the master plan initiation year, there's an opportunity to draw labor into the fold more aggressively than what they, they have been in the past. And they can champion some of these things on our behalf, our behest, uh, because it needs somebody to be fearless and, and really take on some of these matters head on. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're done with questions, and Janine's giving me the side eye. So I'm just going to close up our panel discussion um, with the four takeaways that I think came through very clearly. What's made this master plan successful has been social dialogue, synergy, transparency, and all of that working together to move through or move past the myths that exist in our minds. So I think those would be the takeaways that we want to try and share with the stakeholders of the furniture master plan and hopefully in two years time we become the poster child for the next master plan that's being implemented. So with that, I really want to thank my panelists. Thank you very much, Michael and Etienne, for taking time out of your day and joining us out of Cape Town. Imran and Mark for joining us here, really appreciate it. And thank you to Safi for hosting the textile space at your forum. Thank you.